bow together. We thank you, Father, that like we have sung, you will hold us fast. None of the things that are going on right now have escaped your notice or your sovereignty. In ways that we can't understand, you are at work for your glory. But we pray because it's your will that we do so about the matters of our lives, the matters of our country, and all the things that are going on there, the matters of our health with the coronavirus. And we thank you that you hear when we pray. And that things that otherwise would not happen will happen because we pray. But today we come to you in a circumstance in our country that is unlike anything we have experienced with all the unrest, with all the health issues, with all of the things that are going on. And we who know you today need to be reaffirmed in our faith in you, and we pray that will happen today. That we'll not fear, that we'll not despair, but rather that we'll realize that our God reigns and that he is at work. So today, as we look to your scriptures, open our eyes to what you would want us to learn and to be reminded that we have a king. We have a king who rules over everything. And we pray today that we'll be able to recognize whether we have fully yielded to him or not, and if not, to re-enthrone him where he belongs over our lives. So to those ends, we pray today and ask then that you'll be magnified in our eyes through what we see through the sacred scriptures today, because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge, or as he's better known, S.M. Lockridge, is one of the great African-American preachers that this country has produced. Uh, He grew up in the Midwest back during the Depression days and sensed God's call upon his life to enter into the ministry, came to Texas for his first pastorate as a young man, and then in 1952, he went to San Diego, California, led there by God to pastor and to build one of the largest and most influential churches that our country has ever seen. Scores of people came to know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior through the ministry of Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Um, His colleagues described him as no-nonsense, by-the-book kind of a preacher. And the book that I'm talking about is this book. And um, it's unfortunate that we don't have uh, more of his sermons to listen to or to read. Uh, But there are portions of his sermon, and there's a portion of one sermon that many of us have heard before. and You may be one of them. The sermon was entitled, That's My King. And I wanted you to hear just that portion that maybe you have heard at another time. It's about three minutes long. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and 
but pride. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his firm is light. I wish I could describe him. But yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. Feel free to applaud. Is that our king? Wow. Let's, let's pray and go home, okay? <laughs> well, I only got to hear S.M. Lockridge one time, and at the time I didn't know who he was, and so I didn't know what all the fuss was about him coming to that church. But uh, he was a great, great man with that kind of preaching. I think I could stand a lot more of that. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about That's My King, because the king that we see portrayed on this slide that's the one that probably most of us and hopefully all of us would be able to say today is the one we intend to be our king, Jesus Christ, because we have put our faith and our trust in him, and we have, by doing so, said he is our king. We will follow him. He will rule over us. We're not going to make any decisions or live in any aspect of our lives without his approval, without his leadership. But what I want us to do today, though, is I want us to recognize that while he is the king that we intend to follow, that we preach that we follow, that we sing that we follow, that we think that we follow, I want us to realize today as we look in the book of Judges that it's always possible that he's not the one that we always follow. That there might be not only another king, but there might be several kings ruling over various aspects of our lives. And I want us to see that today in a passage of scripture about a king who rose in Israel a man by the name of Abimelech, probably a man that you've never heard a sermon preached on before, a man who should never have been a king, and we'll learn more about that in just a few moments, but because he was honored as a king, led a portion of Israel into some of the most miserable time that they had during his short reign. And so today, Judges chapter 9, and we're going to look at this man by the name of Abimelech, and we're going to learn what we can then from his example and this portion of history that's recorded for us here and how important it is to make sure that we know who the king is and that we follow the right king. The first part of what I want to share with you today is simply what I'm going to call the man who would be king. By the way, I have outlines that are in the bulletins, and I know some of you haven't been picking up bulletins and you like to take notes and it might uh, help your note-taking in the future if you get one of those uh, uh, inserts, and it will give you some of the outline notes that we have here. But the first part I want us to look at is the man who would be king. And I want to introduce you today to Abimelech. I want to introduce you, first of all, to Abimelech. Uh, let's put together some thoughts about this man and, and how he became king and, and what we're going to discover about him in this ninth chapter primarily. Um, he was one of uh, Gideon's sons. And if you've been with us in recent weeks, we spent about five or six weeks talking about this man of faith, Gideon. What a great man of God who was honored as being part of the Hall of Faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11. And how God used him to defeat the Midianites who was causing great turmoil in the people of Israel's lives. 
Well, after that was all over with and he's entered back into civilian life, uh, he really entered into civilian life because if you go back to the eighth chapter, we'll find out that Gideon got married and had a family. He got married again and again and again and again because if you go back to chapter 8 and verse 30, look at what it says there. Gideon had 70 sons who were his direct descendants, for he had many wives. 70 sons. Makes you wonder how many daughters. He had a whole city by himself, didn't he? 70 sons by his many wives. But there was something different about this guy in Bimelech. He was not among those 70. As the very next verse says, verse 31, he was the son by virtue of a mistress, a concubine. His concubine, who was in the city of Shechem, also bore him a son, and he named him Abimelech. So that's his family heritage. That's what his original uh, background was. The next thing we're going to learn about Abimelech, though, is that he was a man with extreme uh, political aspirations, some ungodly desires. Because now as we get into the ninth chapter, where we're going to spend most of our time today, the chapter begins, now Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, that's another name for Gideon, went to Shechem, that's his hometown, to his mother's relatives and spoke to them and to the whole clan of the household of his mother's father, saying, speak now in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem. Which is better for you, that 70 men, all the sons of Jeroboam or Gideon, rule over you, or that one man rule over you? And also remember that I am your bone and your flesh. He begins lobbying to become the leader of the city of Shechem and hopefully much more the whole region. You can tell from what he describes right here that he has aspirations to be king. He wants to be the chief. He wants to be the head. And apparently by the mentioning of the 70 sons of Jeroboam or of Gideon here, apparently there was some kind of government that maybe they were involved in more or less. Israel has no king at this time. And so along comes Abimelech and he says, which is better? Having these 70 guys who probably are disagreeing and not even knowing that they're disagreeing with one another. Or to have one man, one man where the buck stops. One man who is, has your best interest at heart. And not only so, but I'm one of you. I'm from this very city that uh, he was doing his campaigning in. And he got his family to campaign for him. Verse 3 says, his mother's relatives, and they're probably very influential in the town, spoke all these words on his behalf in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem, and they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our relative. His strength is growing. His political clout is increasing. He was now the talk on the streets, and people were agreeing with the idea, yeah, one man is better than 70 in representing us and bringing the best that we can have in life. By the way, now look in verse 4, find out who it is that really becomes the force behind his campaign and his rise to power. Because it mentions here that there are some men who came, and they're going to be called in verse 4, worthless and reckless fellows. Let me read the whole verse. They gave him 70 pieces of silver from the house of baal Bereth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows, and they followed him. This is his strength. This is his power. This is his mafia. These will be his assassins upon anybody who dares to disagree and who dares to go against Abimelech. And notice something else about the city and about these men in particular. Even though this is an Israelite city, even though Gideon has been used by God to win a great victory, to call the nation and call these people back to himself, Shechem is still a city now that is still given to the worship of Baal. See that in there? Baal, Bereth. And they give him money from the house of Baal Bereth as his initial campaign fund. And they then proceed with the, what follows, which is this. One of, one of the most terrible things you'll read in Scripture in verses 5 and 6. Then he went to his father's house at Ophra and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men, 
on one stone. Look at that. He killed all the brothers. This is what would be typically done in those days and time when a new king came into power. Eliminate all the possibilities that somebody could object or could try to overturn that type of ascendancy to power. And so he goes back and he eliminates what could possibly be the competition, killing all the 70 half-brothers of his back in the city of Ophra. Um, but it says, but the youngest, uh, but Jotham, the youngest of Jeroboam was left, and, and, and he hid himself. And, well, we'll go on there in just a moment. Notice, first of all, though, that it says that this was done on one stone. One stone. He sent out his assassins, his mafia, and they rounded up all those young men, all those sons of Gideon. And it says they brought them to one stone. The idea being that it would be a public execution, one by one on a stone, where one by one their heads would be removed. And they were killed one by one. It was a public statement. It was a political statement. A new sheriff now was in town. And they killed all of those who would be the opposition to him. And right after that bloody scene that's talked about there, look what happens in verse 6. All the men of Shechem... And all of Beth Milo assembled together, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar which was in Shechem. The bloody execution was followed by a glorious coronation, the crowning of Abimelech as the new king. And it's interesting to notice here who it was that approved of his being crowned as king, not just his supporters, not just his assassins and his mafia, but notice now it says, all the men of Shechem, all the men of Shechem, now say this is the best plan. We will go forward with this. The first principle for life that I want us to see as we work our way through this passage comes right here. It's simply to ask the question, who's going to be king? Who's going to be king? Who's going to be king in our lives? Who's going to be king in your life? Who's going to be king in my life? As I mentioned just a few moments ago, We'd love to have that one who's portrayed on that slide as the king of our life. And there are times when maybe we have realized, yes, that's what I have declared. But something that we always have to realize, there's always a rival waiting in the shadows to take his place. Sometimes there's many rivals waiting in the shadows to want us to live this way, to decide that way, to relate over there this way, to do what the popular opinion is to do what the polls say, rather than to follow what that one says. This man, Abimelech, was a man who was an imposter. I shared with you before that God had said back in Deuteronomy that there was a day in which Israel would, be ha would have a king. They would have a king. But this is not the time. This is not the man. This is not God's man. This is a Baal worshiper and He's a man that was not intended by God to sit upon that throne over the people of Israel. Many years ago, Campus Crusade developed a little diagram to kind of drive this point home. Um, they drew a circle, a circle, just a, a circle, that represented our life. And inside the circle, there were little things you could put in there. You could put uh, family, you could put uh, career, education, relationships, all the things that make up our lives go inside the circle. That's our life. In the very center of the circle, there was a little chair drawn representing the throne. And the question that was intended to be asked when you shared this diagram with anyone was to say, who sits upon the throne? Who sits upon the throne? Are you upon the throne? Is somebody else upon the throne? Is your career upon the throne? Are your hobbies upon the throne? Your philosophy, is that upon the throne? What's upon the throne? What is the thing that, that decides how you live your life? And of course, the purpose of the whole thing was to lead people to understand there's only one that needs to sit upon that throne, and that's Jesus Christ. He alone is the one that needs to sit upon that throne. You know, the Bible tells us that when we come to Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, whether we're fully realizing it at that moment or not, we're telling him, take the throne of my life. I've been there too long. My career has been there too long. My friends have been there too long. 
this has been there too long. Please take the throne of my life. When Jesus called his first disciples, you remember what he said to them? Follow me. Come follow me. I am now in charge. Peter, you're not going to be in the fishing business anymore. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm taking the throne now. Matthew, you're not going to collect taxes for the Romans anymore. I'm now the boss. Come follow me. Simon the Zealot, you're not a political activist anymore. That's behind you. Now you're going to come and represent a different kingdom, my kingdom. I'm taking the throne of your life now. He said, come follow me. And that's not changed in what he asks of us when we come to him. It's come follow me. Come follow me. We're to make him the king of our lives. You know, many of us can remember a time in our lives, and maybe even right now we can think of it, when we have um, yielded to or lived under the authority of somebody else. Many of us, when we were children, can remember that time when mom or dad said, do this or don't do that, and what did we do? Well, if you came from the kind of home I did, you did it or you didn't do it <laughs> because they were in charge. They were in charge. When I worked at my first job, my boss said, do this, and I want it done this way. I didn't argue with him. I didn't debate with him. I did what he asked because he was in charge. When I went to school, if my teacher said, I want a paper and I want it done by this date, it was done by that date and using that format and those instructions because she was in charge. She was in charge. That same principle holds in Scripture, but now with somebody who's in charge over everything, over everything. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. Abimelech was an, an imposter, never intended by God to be the king. And he represents to us all those things today that should not be enthroned as king. Well, the next part of the story that I want us to see is what I call three fruitless years as king. Three fruitless years as king. And uh, why do I mention three years? Well, because if you'll fast forward with me down to verse 22, you'll see that that was the length of his reign. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. Three years was all he was in office as king. And so what happened in those three years? How did life go in those three years? Well, let me show you how it began initially through somebody who was probably surprised as, uh, as anyone to find out that God had him to share a message. You remember I told you moments ago that those 70 brothers, those sons of Gideon, were executed? Well, one of them got away. One of them got away. The youngest one, a young man by the name of Jotham. And uh, we read about him, first of all, in verse 5. Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And then after this execution and this coronation that put Abimelech on the throne, now when they told Jotham, verse 7, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim. God's called him to do something, to be a spokesman. And he lifted his voice and called out. Now, if Gerizim sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you're familiar with some of the Old Testament and some of the events that happened at various places. Um, when Israel entered into the Promised Land, uh, after they had won a couple of victories, after the victory at um, Jericho and then later at Ai, uh, in chapter 8, uh, Joshua calls all the people together for a reaffirmation of the covenant with God. And they gather at this place where there's two mountains that stand side by side, a valley runs between them. One is Gerizim, the other one is Ebal. You can read about this in Joshua chapter 8. And he put half of the elders of Israel on, on Ebal, and he put half of them on Gerizim. And then in the presence of all the people, he read the essential things of the law to the people. This is what we have agreed to be before God. He is our God. These are his standards. We will live by them. And as he read the blessings that God would bring, the people on this side would shout, Amen, Amen, as he read those things. And then on the other side, when he talked about the curses that would come upon them, and if they disobeyed God, and they would say, Amen, Amen. Shechem, the city where all this is happening, is, is between Gerizim and Ebal. And so Jotham goes up on the side of Mount Gerizim, where people could clearly see him and could hear him as he cried out his message. And uh, he went up on the mountain, obviously, because the assassins would have silenced him before he got very far with his message. And, and he has a message. He has a parable to share with the people. Let's uh, listen to the parable that he shares. He said to them, uh, in the hearing of all, Listen to me, O men of Shechem, 
that God may listen to you. Once the trees went forth to anoint a king over them, and, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my fatness with which God and men are honored and go to wave, go to wave over the trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, you come reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my fruit, good fruit and go wave over the trees? Then the trees said to the vine, the grapevine, You come reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my new wine which cheers God and men and go wave over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the bramble, You come reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you are anointing me as king over you, Come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, may fire come out from the bramble and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Did you catch all that? Kind of already understand with our perspective that we can have on all of this as to what this is going to be about, right? Trees want to have a king over them. And one by one, the various trees in Israel are invited to serve as that king. There's the invitation that's extended to the, to the olive tree. You come be king. And the olive tree says, no, I, God's given me another purpose. He's given me a calling. I'm to produce olive oil, which is so important to our nation. Same thing with the fig tree. I produce figs. That's what God has called me to do. He's given me to do. I'm not fit to be a king. Same thing with the, the vine that produces the grapes from which they get their wine. And, oh, that's such, a, such an important part of their culture. I, I'll not be king. God has not given me that. God has given me something else to do. And then they come to the bramble. And you can tell by even that word translated bramble, that's a bad thing, can't you? It's a word for a thorn bush. Word for a thorn bush. It's a worthless thing. It produces no fruit. It's just something that grows and it just gets in the way and it's got stickers on it or thorns on it and, and you want to stay away from it because it's bad news. The only thing that the bramble was ever good for was when it dried out, it could be used as firewood to be burned up. But notice what the bramble says. The bramble says, hey, I like the idea. I'd love to be your king. Um, will you bow down before me if I'm your king? I'm glad you recognize I'm good for you. Notice what he says. He says, you can uh, rest in my shade, verse 15. That's figurative language to say that uh, I can really bless you. I can bring good life to you. There's almost humor in that little statement that you can rest in my shade because the bramble only grew to be about yay tall. Nobody could rest in that shade. There was nothing good to be found in the bramble. And then the rest of verse 15 talks about the danger that is posed by the bramble because those thorn bushes grew in groups and whenever one of them catch on, caught on fire and then the fire swept through them, you know, it could destroy even the great cedars, those wonderful, wonderful trees, those richest of trees there. And then having told the parable, Jotham doesn't leave any doubt as to what he's talking about. Look at verses 16 through 20. Now, therefore, if you have dealt in truth and integrity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam, Gideon, and his house, and have dealt with him as he deserved, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you from the hand of Midian. But you have risen against my father's house today, and have killed his son, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your relative. If then you have dealt in truth and integrity with Jeroboam and his house this day, rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, if you've not acted as people of integrity, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. In short, what's the message? You've chosen the bramble to be your king. You've chosen the one who is worse for you, not the one who is best. You've chosen someone who doesn't deserve that right to sit as chief or as ruler over you in any capacity. You have chosen the bramble. 
You've dishonored my father who once said, if you look back to chapter 8 and verse 23, Gideon had said when they offered him to become king, and he says, I'll not be king over you, neither will any of my sons be king over you. That's for God to decide. He underestimated Abimelech and what Abimelech's aspirations were. And so Jotham warned them of the dangers of having chosen the wrong king. They've chosen a king that produces no fruit for them at all. That brings us to a, a second principle then. Our first principle was is who's going to be king in our lives. The second principle is to examine ourselves and to see what kind of fruit is in our lives. Because the fruit that's in our lives is what will tell who is the king over our lives. Remember how Jesus used to talk about you shall know them by their fruits? He says, you examine the fruit of the preachers, you examine the fruit of the prophets, and you can tell whether they belong to me or not. In fact, in John chapter 10, he told the story about himself being the vine, you know, another parable, I'm the vine, and you who are my followers are the branches. And by virtue of the branches, connection to the vine and the life of the vine flowing through the branches, they produce fruit. They produce fruit. God will produce fruit if we're following him. The king will produce fruit if we're following him. Whatever king we're following will produce a certain kind of fruit. The question is, is what kind of fruit is God looking for? Well, what is the Bible look, talking about when it says that um, God wants to see fruit in our lives? You know, what, what kind of fruit? Uh, let me just give you a quick sampling of some of the kinds of fruit that the Bible uh, talks about God's producing and wanting to produce in our lives. I just gave you three samples here on, on your outline. Um, one kind of fruit is the fruit of a changed character, of a changed character, being becoming a different person in every aspect in our lives, but being a person who has a totally different character. I'll take you to Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23, which talks about that fruit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit because it's God's Holy Spirit that produces it in us. The fruit of the Spirit is, and then there's nine things listed, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we truly come to Jesus Christ, and if he is our king, and these are the kinds of things that will begin to emerge in our lives, uh, we will be people who are more loving than we used to be, more concerned about the needs of those around us than we used to be. Uh, we'll be more joyful in the midst of difficult times, even like our nation is facing right now. Uh, we'll be more at peace about things because our God is in control. We'll be more patient with people who disappoint us, and on we could go through the list. But we'll be people who are people of greater understanding and greater ability then to keep following our king in the midst of difficult times. Another kind of fruit is the fruit of celebration, fruit of celebration. And I direct your attention to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, because here, we're here we read that... Uh, um, through him, then, let us continue to offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. The fruit of celebration, the fruit of worship. When he is our king, we find it almost compelling that we want to worship him. We find joy in worshiping him. We, don't, we just can't stay away from it. He deserves it, and we know that, and, and we find great satisfaction and fulfillment, and, and there's, a, there's a need that begins to develop in us. I've got to go and express my love, my adoration, my thanks, and my desire to serve him. Fruit of celebration. Let me give you one more. That would be the fruit of, uh, of commitment, the fruit of commitment to him. Or if you want a fancy word, you could put the word consecration there, the fruit of consecration. Very next verse in um, Hebrews 13, it says, Do not neglect doing good and sharing with such sacrifices that God is pleased. Do not neglect doing good. But we become committed to wanting to know, what does God want in my life? What has Jesus shown me that he wants in my life? What has he told me he wants in my life? And we become consumed with those things. I'm consumed with those things. But those are kind of the kinds of fruit that will be produced in our lives when Jesus is indeed our king. I was thinking this week as I was uh, preparing this, 
some churches I uh, used to attend when I was a kid. We can't do this so much anymore because we have to have exit signs over the doors, you know, because of safety measures and so forth. But uh, uh, more than one church that I attended used to have a sign on either side of the entrance door. And you may have seen this in churches you've attended as well. On the outside, as you entered in here, it would say, enter to worship, enter to worship. And then on the opposite side, as you would leave after worship that day, it would say, depart to serve, depart to serve. And it was just a last second reminder every week for anybody who glanced up and saw those signs of what it means to have Jesus as king. We come to worship him, we depart to serve him. Well, there's one more part of Abimelech's story, and um, I would just simply call this part a miserable ending to a miserable man's miserable reign. And um, yeah, I know there's a lot of verses left, right? And uh, we're not going to read them all. Uh, take that as your home assignment, that uh, if you want to read through all the details of this. But let me just give you the principle, first of all, that we're going to see in what's found here in the rest of the chapter. Uh, and the, principles, the principle is this. Uh, there are consequences for following the wrong king. There are consequences for following the wrong king. Um, if we were to put a title over um, this last remaining uh, big section of the book of Judges, it would be that this tells us about the miserable ending of a miserable man's miserable reign. Because that's what we discover happens with this man Abimelech at the end of his three years of, of reign. Um, let me summarize just very quickly what you're going to find as you go home and as you read the rest of this. I'll hopefully give you enough notes so you can kind of figure out some of what was kind of going on. But there were, um, there were at least three uh, significant things um, that we're going to see that were going on. Let me notice, uh, have you notice with me, first of all, that um, when verse 22 says that Abimelech ruled for three years, uh, that's more than just a note to just tell us how long he was there. I think it's there to tell us that, you know, for three years he had it all. He had it all. He had wealth. He had power. He had people who bowed to him as king. I mean, he had everything that uh, a ruler could ever want. He had it all. Um, but then we're going to see that God gets involved in verse 23 because there came a time when God said, that's enough. That's enough. And by the way, do you ever feel that's like, like that sometimes you wonder why won't God do something we look at stuff that's going on even right now why doesn't God get involved and do something to stop this craziness why doesn't God do something things just keep rolling right along and it's almost as if God doesn't care as if God is unconcerned and if that is your feeling I hope today that you would walk away realizing God does care and as we look at things that are going on and it looks like people are getting away with stuff, I want you to know nobody gets away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. Sometimes their judgment is going to fall in this life. Sometimes they're going to be stopped in their tracks in this life. But for sure, they'll be stopped in their tracks in the life to come and things that we think they're getting away with. But God gets involved. And notice after the three years what God does. He sends an evil spirit, verse 23 between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. God sent an evil spirit. Isn't that an amazing statement about the sovereignty of God? How he takes even fallen angels and uses them for his glory? Erwin Lutzer has written an interesting book about the devil entitled God's Devil. A book about Satan and how bad Satan is and all the terrible things the Bible says about Satan. But all along the way he says, but God uses him for his glory. And one day when it's all over with, Satan is tossed into the lake of fire because God's done with him. But God takes an evil spirit and this evil spirit works in numerous ways to bring an end to this miserable man's miserable reign. Let me tell you about the ways that he does this. First of all, and I'll just cite this and you can read about these later. Uh, in verses 24 and 25, it talks about uh, the men who had been his mafia, these are his supporters, began raiding the treasury. Raiding the treasury, that's one thing they did. You know, where did uh, Abimelech continue to get his wealth and his riches for his government? Well, it was from caravans, traders coming into the city, having gone off and done their business, and they come back, you know, loaded with gold and silver and so forth, and they're coming to the city. And in verses 24 and 25, it says, 
in verse 25 in particular, that the men of Shechem sent men in ambush on those people who were coming back with all these riches, and they would rob them. The money that ultimately would line the pockets of King Abimelech never got to him because they were stealing it for themselves. These were his supporters. Be careful who you choose to be your supporters, right? Be careful who portrays themselves as supporters. But then beyond that, in verses 26 and following, we're going to see that there was a revolution in the city where he reigned. In this city of Shechem, and you can read the, uh, the details about this later, there are going to be some names that are mentioned only here. A guy by the name of Gaal in verse 26 who came and stirred up the people against Abimelech. And, and another guy, Zebul, who happened to be one of Abimelech's hidden spies who tells Abimelech about the revolt that's formulating against him. And, well, long story short, Abimelech comes to punish the city. He knows how to deal with people who disagree with him. He eliminates them. Takes the 70 sons and he kills them. He comes upon the city of Shechem. And what does he do? He just starts killing people. Eliminating people who have dared to raise their voice against him or who have not taken up the cause to support him while those uh, revolutionaries were planning on his end. And, and he just kills them and, um, and destroys them. There's an interesting part to this story when you get down to verse uh, 46 and following because the people are terrified of him, seeing how he's just going through and killing everybody inside. And they go inside the city tower. Many cities had towers in those days rather than big walls around them, and people would flee into the tower and bolt the doors, and the enemies then couldn't get to them. And uh, Abimelech deals with the people in the tower just like he does with uh, anybody who opposes them. He tells these men, bring some brush, and they put brush all around the base of the tower and set it on fire and destroy all the people in the tower. He's still not satisfied, though, because if you keep reading, you're going to see that he goes on from there to another city where he suspects that people are opposing him, a little city called Thebes. Same thing. He goes in and he just starts killing people right and left. And again, the people run into the tower, those who can, to get away. The women, the children, the men who can get away, and they bolt the doors. And he starts to do the same thing as he did before. Get the brush. Let's make a fire around here. We'll just destroy everybody in there. Well, this time something happened that he wasn't anticipating. There was a woman who went up into that tower, and the Scripture says... Uh, she carried a millstone with her. I find that almost comical, don't you? She carried a millstone. What's she doing carrying a millstone? Well, either it was the most important possession of her life, and she, you know, she, she's not going to get this, and she goes up in the tower with this millstone. This thing is big and heavy, by the way. It's about 12 to 18 inches in diameter. It's round, you know, and they used to roll over the grain to make flour with it. And here she goes up in the tower. It's a little old lady carrying this millstone. What she didn't realize is God had a providential purpose for carrying the millstone. Because as the battle was pressed upon them, she throws the, will, the millstone out the window to try to defend themselves. And guess whose head it hit? Abimelech's. And the scripture says that when she threw it out, verse 55, it hit his head and crushed his skull. And the story goes on then as he realizes uh, in that day and time what an indignity that would be for him to die because of what a woman did to him. He tells his armor bearer, please stab me with the sword because I don't want it to be said that I was killed by a woman. Okay? But there was revolt in the cities. And the last thing I would say then that God did with his spirit and in doing what I have just described, it is this, God removed him. God removed him from power. And if you read the last few verses of the chapter, you see that God explains himself. Verse 55, when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed to their homes. But then, verse 56, God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God returned all the wickedness of the men of Shechem on their heads, and the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam, came upon them. God removed him. God removed him. So let's do a quick review, shall we? What, what have we seen? This is a lot of material, isn't it? Big chapter. First, we've seen that it's important to know who the king is in our life. Make sure that we've chosen the right king. Absolutely essential that we have um, identified and made sure that we've chosen the right king. We also need to examine our lives because we've seen that uh, the fruit shows who is king. 
the things that occupy our time, our interests, our best effort, um, those things will tell us who is king in our lives. The fruit of our lives will tell us that. But this last thing that we want us to note is that um, the king that you choose is going to impact your life, not only in the here and now, but also for all eternity. For all eternity. Um, choosing the wrong king in the here and now may, uh, may get you lots of stuff. It may get you prosperity. It may get you fame. It may get you power. It may get you popularity. Success. Success. That's what we live for, success. It may get you all those things. But it'll get you nothing for eternity if you choose the wrong king. If you choose the right king, well, there's no promise you're going to get all that other stuff. You may not be prosperous. You may not be powerful. You may not be uh, the most famous. You may not be much of anything. But the good news about choosing the right king is that the best is yet to come. We're not living for this life. We're living for the life to come. And so it's essential that we choose the right king. Have you done so? Have you done so? Has there been a time in your life when you realize that Jesus Christ is the one who died for your sins, he and he alone? Have you come to realize that only by faith in him is there the gift of eternal life? And by faith in him, you have an eternal home waiting for you someday that none can take away. All this stuff in this life, it's going to pass. It's all going to pass. But what we're doing now and following the king, that lasts forever. That lasts forever. As S.M. Lockridge said at the very beginning, do you know him? Do you know him? If not, won't you put your faith in him and trust him as your Lord and Savior? Or if you'd like to talk to me further about that, wouldn't you talk to me? We'll set up a time and talk about how you can make Jesus Christ your king. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for this story with all its strange twists and turns. Sounds like just a history story, but we realize today that it's always like so much of your word, all of your word, much more than that. And so today I pray that you'd help us to um, truly examine our hearts to make sure that we have found the king and that we put our faith and our trust in him and that we're following the king. Let us be bold enough and honest enough to say that we begin the day wanting to honor our king and whatever we do, wherever we go, whomever we meet, be our king, Lord Jesus. Amen.